Welcome to the Pursuit of Growth show. My name is Greg Brinkley. This is the show where we interview fascinating individuals from all aspects of life and really have candid conversations about personal development, personal growth, professional experiences, and ultimately find some key takeaways that can help us all as we continue to move forward in our lives. I'm joined as always by my co-host and co-author of the Pursuit of Growth book, Sammy Gonzalez. What's up, Sammy? Hey, how's it going, Greg? Always good. Awesome. Well, I'm so happy to be here today. I think the audience is going to get a kick out of learning about who the gentleman here with us is today. A fascinating human being. He's got a lot of great jokes uh, that he's used in the past. Uh, I think we're going to get a laugh or two, and, and I think we're going to get those hard-hitting questions, right? Uh, I know we're definitely going to talk some cricket here soon, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll dig into that too. So I will introduce Nafis Alam. He is a Chief Executive Officer of DRG Concepts, a premier restaurant development and operations company. As CEO, Alam directs a high caliber DRG Concepts corporate and restaurant team in delivering top quality culinary and dining to guests every day with innovations in the way that cuisine and commerce connect. In November of 2019, Alam was named to the DCEO Magazine Dallas 500 list of most influential business leaders. Alam serves on the board of directors for the Greater Dallas Restaurant Association and is a board member of the Bridge of North Texas Homeless Recovery Center. He also serves in corporate volunteer leadership and advisory positions for the North Texas Food Bank. Not to mention, he is also directing community programs in Bangladesh to help provide culinary education and career opportunities for the underserved. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say welcome to Nafis Alam. He resides in Las Colinas with his wife, Nadia, and his baby son, Namir. So, welcome, welcome to the Pursuit of Growth show. Thank you, Sammy and uh, Greg. I fondly call you Batman and Robin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, who is who, right? I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> I'll let you guys figure it out. You know, it could be interchangeable, you know, uh, depending on what the moment calls for. So, but, you know, uh, but really, thank you for having me. It's always uh, great to see you guys, and it's an honor uh, to be here. Well, I think the honor is all ours, and I think people are really going to enjoy learning more about you and your background and and um, really the the ability for you to to do so much, because uh, I know you're you're a man of many trades and many tricks up your sleeve. So um, I think one of the things that we talked about in your bio is that, you know, there's definitely the big restaurant presence. You are a restaurateur. And uh, one, I just think that's badass. So uh, I just say that that's a cool title to have. So the first question that we wanted to kind of dig up for you is, if you could provide dinner to a hero of yours, what would you serve and who would you be serving? Okay. The person I'll be, you know, hypothetically, if sure. I were to see that person, it would be Anthony Bourdain. Ah, and yes. I would serve him. Um, I, I cook a mean, mean biryani. You know, I, I, you know, I, 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 my wife tells me it's, it's really great. My friends tell me it's really great. I would serve him a plate of that and ask him to tell me what he, what he thought about it. Wow. So you're talking about one of my all-time, I guess, heroes or icons that I, I've always looked up to. Um, be just for the, and I see you as very, very similar in, in the fact that of your career and your travels, which we'll get into more. But so I have to ask you the question because I don't think I've had birani. Birani? Biryani. Okay. So, so it's, it's a rice dish. Okay. It's uh, from South Asia. Uh, you mix, you know, different kind of meats, whether it's a, a, a chicken curry or a goat curry or, uh, you know, a beef curry into rice and put all kind of so spices, nuts, raisins, any dried fruit, anything that you can think of. And just it's a one plate meal that you serve during, you know, a wedding or celebration and whatnot. But, you know, it's people something, you know, when that is cooking in the house, you are looking forward to it. Man, today is going to be a great day. It's like Thanksgiving every day when you cook it. I love that. So, Nafis, it's interesting you mentioned Anthony Bourdain. 
I, I don't watch much television. Yeah. But I have one all-time favorite show, and I never missed it, whether it was when he was on the Travel Channel or when he moved to CNN and did Parts Unknown. But anytime Anthony Bourdain was on TV with his show, for me, it was much, much watched television. Had to see it. And I always told people, I think one of the reasons why I was so attracted to that show was one, I traveled kind of through him right. and was really be able to experience different aspects of the world, um, you know, that he traveled. But one of the things that I thought was so unique about him was it wasn't just about the food. It was actually more about the people and the food was just the vehicle that brought people together. Right. And so I'd be interested to learn from you. What were some of the things that attracted you to Anthony Bourdain and really got you to where, um, you know, he would be the person you would like to serve this meal to? You know, everywhere, everywhere that you see, whether you watch CNN or Fox or whatever you watch, right? You get the idea that people are very different from you, right? You know, you're like, hey, somebody's pitting one person against another, right? This guy going around the world where we see people as our friends or enemy or different, they, they eat weird stuff, right? Mm -hmm. He makes it everyday, he, he has different meal and makes everyday conversation with somebody who he just met, right? Makes it so casually easy. I think that's what attracted me to watching his show. I, I don't, like you, man, I don't really watch a lot of TV. Um, um, I don't, a lot of, like my wife has favorite shows and whatnot. Um, I don't watch them. The only thing I watch is a reruns of Bourdain shows. You know, I have a list of four or five that I watch over and over again, you know. Uh, and then, you know, I watch Chef's Table and shows like that, you know. Yeah. So um, he really opened up, truly opened up the world to uh, people like us. Yeah, I agree. And I think what's so fascinating is I'll never forget an episode that I watched where he was actually in Waco, Texas. Yeah. And he spent the day with Ted Nugent. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Ted Nugent is a, is a, a famous overly right-wing conservative yeah. where Anthony Bourdain would describe himself or he would have described himself as more of a liberal type approach. And to your point, these two individuals could sit down, agree to disagree, but also be able to find their commonalities and to be able to enjoy food and barbecue and whatever it was together. And I think it was just one of those things that just really made you hopeful about people. Right. And whether it was that episode or when he traveled to Iran yeah. and, and really was able to, uh, to, to meet with people and to hear a different side of, of, of the folks from that country, right. like you said, it just opened up my eyes to the world and just how different we are, but how similar right. we are. Right. Everybody has the same aspirations, same goal. You know, you want to have a kid, you know, family, then provide for them, you know, have a good life, go to vacations. Everybody all around the world have the same idea. We just may be doing it differently or different time zones, different stuff. It's the same idea. Mm -hmm. But everybody make it seem like, you know, somebody's so different than us just because, you know, we look differently or we talk differently or we speak differently, right? You know, so I think he made it very human. He made it very local and that's what i liked about that show yeah. i actually i took a trip over to miami um gosh this was years ago now and i actually watched a couple of his episodes while he was in miami and did kind of the the trail of bourdain so i went to a couple of different restaurants and, and it was he left his mark not only did you know the restaurant have a, his picture on the wall like signed photo but you could then see the other people that were ordering some of the similar things too. So it was, a, it was amazing to see again, that shared commonality amongst people because they didn't look like me, you know, they're totally different than me and we were enjoying the same experience. And so that connective tissue between like the two people was through that, that ability to share exactly the same food. And then all of us, all of us kind of gave that knowing nod, like, yeah, yeah we're, we're not so different. Yeah. He was here, you know, uh, just like that movie Shawshank Redemption, where he said Billy was here, you know, you, right. know, you write it down. So it's, you know, uh, all of us, we look different, but we're pretty much the same, man. Absolutely. This is very true. Well, you know, one of the things that I was fascinated by, Nafis, in terms of, of preparing for this interview tonight is, you know, I went online and, and researched and, and read some articles about you, 
that, and I learned some things that I had never known about you before. And uh, it was really inspiring and, and, and very, uh, I think, fascinating. And I wanted to start with, um, what was it like for you? And if I'm, if I'm not incorrect, you moved to the United States from Bangladesh yeah. when you were 17. Is that correct? Right. Tell us a little bit about what did you know about the United States before you made the move here? What did you discover when you arrived? And what led you to make a decision to move countries and to be able to come here and, and start on the path that you, uh, that you took on? Right. So, man, um, it's a loaded question. So my, right. my, my answer is going to be fairly long, but you know, I'll, 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 I'll say it out anyway. Yeah, we've got time. <laughs> man, uh, what, I, what I saw was I was an avid fan of Beverly Hills 90210. I grew up <laughs> watching that, right? Grew up watching MacGyver and all these shows, right? And it's like, man, America is great, right? But then, you know, all my, so we went to private school in Bangladesh and more, the, the, the path was, you know, you would, you would go, you know, you finish your high school and then you would apply to colleges all over. Either some would go to England or some would come to the U.S. So my path was most of my close friends applied to school in the U.S., and okay. I wanted to kind of be in that same circle, same pack. But most of my friend, um, so something happened along the way. When I was 15, when I was 16, my, my father passed away, right? So everybody had plans and that, that threw a monkey wrench into my plan that I couldn't go because I wasn't going to just come here and trying to wing it, obviously somebody has to finance that for me. And mm -hmm. my father was that person. But when he passed away, we felt we, we faced some hardship, you know, businesses, you know, that were doing well, were not, not doing well. My mom was by myself. I had an older brother. And, you know, my, my, my trajectory started shifting. So it's either you know, don't think about going to the U.S., go somewhere closer, less expensive, and, and call it a day. But I really, really wanted to come here. And what I really started looking at, my friends were going to school like in NYU or you know, University of Boston or UC Berkeley and, and, and places like that where it's big city, you know, schools and it's expensive school. There was a Princeton guy a school guide that everybody would go through and then it would rank the school and so i went through the school guide and i marked up places that was the least expensive school right my criteria was i need to go i will make it work right I just need to find the least expensive school in the u.s right that led me to a place that gave me a total shock. I ended up going to University of Arkansas <laughs> out of all places. Okay, right? so time out. Yeah. So you're attracted to 90210. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. And you end up in Arkansas. So, yeah. okay, so continue. <laughs> yeah. So, and my only criteria was, you know, that has the lowest tuition possible in that time when I was going to school. So I, I applied, you know, obviously I got accepted and here I am in the U S right. So the first day that I came, I actually came uh, through New York and I had an aunt who lived there. So I naturally, you know, I haven't seen her in a while. So I, I wanted to make a stopover, stay there a couple of days and then move or fly to Arkansas and start my college. The first night I was there, the building that I was in, the next door building was a taller building than this building. This was an eight or nine story building. The other building was 17 story. And that building crashed, fell onto this building. And I've lost everything that I've came with in the US. Wow. Yeah. 
So you say it cracked, like, like it, 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 it fell on top. It, it, something was wrong with that building. It was raining. Something happened. It was an abandoned building, and it. Oh, it's it, abandoned building. It just, okay, got it. Wow. It fell, wow. It fell right. Whew. So fire. I, I first my first day in America. You know, people are Welcome. knocking down the door. Fire service man trying to get out, and we get out just with the clothes that we were on. All like the money that I brought, all my stuff, it's all gone. Right. Yeah. From came in and then, you know, uh, long story short, um, I ended up meeting uh, Rudy Giuliani that day. He came to visit. He was the mayor of New York back then yeah. and started talking to me, uh, among other people, and kind of heard my story. So it's like, hey, man, my office is going to buy you a ticket to go to, um, go to Arkansas and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. Right. Wow. Um, wow. It was actually pretty. Um, the first, second day I was in the cover or, or the cover of a newspaper in, in New York as like a fresh guy, fresh off the boat. This is what he gets dealt yeah. with. Right? But then I the went- The American to, dream, right? And then yeah. the building <laughs> fall on you. <laughs> went, to, went to Arkansas, you know, I stayed there for a semester, man. And I was like, I wasn't feeling it. The people were nice. I had a great time drinking beer all day long, you know, I started drinking beer on, on Tuesdays, you know, <laughs> <laughs> went through the whole college. Actually, I was there, yeah, for, 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 for one semester. And then I started applying for school where, you know, I would get a scholarship, right? Uh, I was chasing the money. Mm -hmm. uh, so then UT Austin and UT Arlington gave me scholarship, but UT Arlington gave me a full ride. Mm. So I switched and then came to Dallas right after that and started going to school in UT Arlington. And I've been here ever since. What wow. is it about this area that you've seen? I mean, that's an amazing story, especially the fact that you, you went from, you know, the, uh, the dream of coming to America and you're in New York, right? You're in like the happening place outside of, you know, the West Coast or whatever. Right. And then you go, in, you go to Arkansas, yeah. Yeah. So then, uh, I guess uh, for for all of our friends out there in Arkansas, a little bit of an upgrade coming over to Dallas, right? Maybe in a, in, in yeah. our minds. Yeah. Um, but when you landed here and and you started, what was it about Dallas and, and this region here that made you want to stay here? Because you you've been here ever since. Right. Right. You know, it felt home. You know, my friends are here. I know the roads. I know the people. I know the area. You know, you always try to be, when you're away from where you grew up, you want to be close to people that you care about, that you love, you know, that you hang out with. You want to be, Dallas is that place for me. I mean, I've now lived more in Dallas than I've lived in where I, where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. So Dallas essentially is home. And it's been a great home to me. You know, people are friendly. You know, uh, you see all this stuff that happens all over. You get treated poorly, this and that. Never happened to me, right? So, you know, I was, you know, just, just before this meeting, we were, we were touring with the Clyde Warren Park people. We are looking at a restaurant there to do. And then the board was asking me why, same question that you asked me, why Dallas? Why not Dallas? This is an amazing place. Everybody is friendly. You can do whatever you want. You can ask, call up anybody and ask for help is there, regardless of who you are. So Dallas has been that place for me, man. I love that. Yeah. So Nafis, when you arrived at UTD, UT I'm imagining, I'm sorry? UT Arlington. UT Arlington, I'm sorry, thank you. When you arrived at UT Arlington, your ambitions weren't the restaurant industry. What were you going to school for? And how did, how did the shift happen that led you to where you are today? Can you, can you, can you, can you guess what I was going to school for? And I won't, I won't label you anything or I won't, uh, I won't call you anything. You know, what, <laughs> what is, say uh, you had a football scholarship and you were playing quarterback for the football team. I was, <laughs> I was going to say hand model, maybe, no, you know, no, something no, like that. No, no, no. <laughs> See, you, you dodged that question, but I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, my, my degree was in information systems, right? Okay. The thing before 
um, before or when I was going to school, anybody that you ask, hey man, you gotta go learn some programming, do some this, do some that, and you're you're golden. The job is guaranteed, right? So you're mm-hmm. you're chasing that job, right? So my my degree was in information systems and business management. So I I graduated with that. So and I love how you talked about earlier. You made the comment that you're chasing the money, and I, you made the comment again you're chasing the money. Well, it's clear that to Sammy and I, we know you. We know you do very well. Right. But I would argue that while you do very well, you're chasing your passion. Right. And you have found something that really, really matters to you in your life. How did you go from that, pursuing that degree? What was the transition to get you into the restaurant world? Right. So, you know, when I say chasing the money, you know, uh, it may come off wrong, but I don't, I love what I do. Mm-hmm. And uh, my wife always asked me, uh, my, my business partner asked me, what are you going to do when you, when you retire? First of all, I'm not going to retire. And if I do, I would probably go buy, you know, a small house on a cliff in Bali and then open up a eight seater restaurant and I'm going to be the chef and I'm going to be cooking for people five nights a week and I'll serve. That's my retirement plan. So, you know, what I do is I, I, I like what I do. Right. So, uh, when I got out of school, man, um, things were kind of tough. It was right after 9-11. It wasn't the best climate for people um, to, to get out. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak here. I'll, I'll be candid. It wasn't, uh, especially if you had a Muslim name, you know, to go and, and get a job anywhere you wanted, right? Um, but I got a job with a company called Nokia anyways. You know, it was a great job. But along the way, you know, a few months into the job, I went to see a friend from school in Atlanta. And when we went there, my friend took me to an Atlanta Braves game. And we're drinking beer, watching a game. And this gentleman in mid-40s or early 50s started talking to me say hey what do you do seem like a bright young guy you know what do you do so I, I was telling that I was a fresh grad working for a company and he basically said you know we're always recruiting young people like you smart people why don't you come work for us I said well I'm not necessarily looking for a job you know I'm here but I'm curious what is what is the company when he told me the name of the company, I kind of fell off my chair. I said, there is no way I'm working for your company. First of all, I don't even know. I've never been in one. So I'll, I'll tell you what that company was. It's a company called Waffle House. Okay. Yeah. So he happened to be the executive vice president of that company. He was the number three guy of the company. Wow. Um, and, you know, he was right there and I was talking to him and, you know, he kind of said, hey, I, I want to offer you a job. I, I thanked him. I said, well, I wasn't looking for one. I came back to Arlington or Dallas. And I kept thinking the whole time that I wonder what this place is. I've never been to one. So there's a Waffle House on I-30 and Collins, right where the Cowboy Stadium is. Right? I took one of my friends and said, hey, man, I want to go grab a bite to eat. Would you come and eat with me? So he comes with me. We go in. We sit. We order. And he's like, why the hell are we eating here? <laughs> you know, why are we here? And I didn't say anything. And I started looking around and saying, there's no way I'm working for, for this. Nothing against them. There's no way I'm working for them. But man, you know, All I could think about was that. So two weeks later, I called up the guy and, you know, he said, hey, you know, I'm interested. You know, what's what's next? Well, why don't you come to Atlanta? Our corporate office is here. Come and see me. You know, you know, we have plenty of jobs open in in the corporate office. And um, come and have a look at it. I go there, did interviews, all went well. 
offered me a position in one of their business department. And, but I said, well, if I were to do this, I want to, I want to work in the restaurant. I want to learn. He kind of laughed at me. He said, you're going to leave in two days. So I said, well, you know, try, try me. I want to try. So I figured like, what's, I can always go get a job in Nokia or somebody like, like that, you know, I'm just going to try it. And he kind of laughed at me, but then next thing you know, I left Dallas, moved to Atlanta, started working for Waffle House in a restaurant, mm -hmm. running a Waffle House. And it was a brutal assault to anything that I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Holy bleep, it was crazy, right? But I learned so much about that business. It is such a fascinating company. They are privately owned, grows. They, they sell everything to themselves. They, they run a mean, mean, mean P&L and they make money, right? Yeah. They make cash money. And I kind of fell in love with that business from that. Right? It's like, man, this is amazing. Then I got... I kept getting promotions. I was with them for four, four, four and a half years. Um, before I left it, I was running a decent sized area in Dallas. I came back to Dallas because the guy who hired me he was my boss and he moved to the territory and said, man, I want, I want, I want you to come with me. And Dallas was home. I came back to my friends, but then I was doing this, but then a few, few, uh, Years later, I started that I'm going to do my own thing. You know, my business, current business partner, Mike, I met him while I was in school. His uh, younger brother was my friend in school, so we knew. And we started talking. And next thing you know, we opened our first restaurant. I left Waffle House, and I've been doing this ever since. Well, as someone who spent many a late night in the farmer's branch at Waffle House, yeah. Um, which you know, one? I'm a big fan. Farmers of Bellwood and uh, 35? Uh, Beltline, well, the one on Beltline and Midway. Okay, the newer one. Yeah, it's a newer one. I, I, it's either Beltline and Midway or Beltline and Marsh. Beltline and Marsh. Two roads. No, yes, Beltline, Beltline and Marsh. Right next to the car wash. Yes, by yeah. the, the car spa. Yeah, I so opened Sammy and I spent many a late night in that location. I don't know if you know, but that was one of my opening stores. Really? I did not know that. No. Yeah, I so opened, I just wonder. <laughs> that was under me when it opened. What, what year would that have opened? Uh, 2005 or 2004. Okay, so I lived in Addison then. So yeah. it's just funny how we, how we have crossed paths and didn't even realize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, that's amazing that you took that because you know, a lot of people that, that we talk to, you know, Greg and I look at growth and, and opportunities and, and we seek the chance to, to continue learning, like lifelong learning is, is such a key factor in our lives. So when you're, when you're approaching the, you know, the, the number three in command of Waffle House, right? And you're saying like, put me in that restaurant, you know, like I want to work there. I want to learn there. What were some of the key takeaways that you had from actually being there it, you know, and in, into running these restaurants. It's like driving a car. You have to know what moves the wheels. You have to know what switches to, to push to have the blinkers on or the headlights on and so on or the AC on. With the business, it was a crash course on running a business and you were responsible for your PL to your employees to anything that you can think of right and i got a like a crash course in running my own business every day i was there and it was brutal you had to wake up at it was like an army drill people wake up at four in the morning and go to the work at five and you were there till like three or four in the morning if i could do this i i, I tell this to everybody so look man if I, if anybody does Waffle House for that person, anything after that is, is a cake and a walk in the park. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's again, yeah. It's, it, I mean, how can you go about running 
an operation right. without being in the operation. And I think that's where some people bypass that growth. Right. You know, they think that they need that they're entitled number one to hear, right. you know, and that they can get here and get here without ever starting down here, you know, right. and, and not to look at that as a, as a challenge, but look at it as that opportunity right. to enhance. And I, I looked at it this way, restaurant, you know, like I, I grew up eating food and I would sneak out, take my bike when I was a little kid, go to the bakery and sit there and eat and get fascinated by how they were making all that stuff behind. I always would like peek behind just to see what was going on. As a little kid, I, that's what I did. And I would come home, my mom would ask like, where are you, we're gonna have dinner. I was full, but then I would sit down and eat because I didn't wanna get the beating. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, hey, you're just going to get slapped now because you ate outside. It was like a taboo eating outside man, when you're a kid. But I always was fascinated with restaurants or a, or a cart in the street, how they got everything done. And they're making, you know, a livelihood there. They're, they're making everything on that cart and selling it to you. People are lining up, eating, having fun. It was actually pretty amazing to see. So I always like that right so i'm glad whatever i'm doing you know falls in line with that when you go ahead, okay, go ahead sammy uh, i was i finished up your line of question and just i don't want to overstep what you're about to say because i was going to talk a little bit about the current situation of the world and and what that what we're what we're pivoting in right now yeah man uh, kind of terrible right now you know uh, um we're here having a Zoom call in a protected building. You're in your house. Greg is in his house. There's a lot of people that are hurting right now, hurting, hurting more than, than we are, right? You know, we're, what has happened to our industry is terrible right now. You know, there's a lot of people are shut down. They don't know if they're going to be coming back. Uh, they don't know if they'll ever come back. And they may have to find something else to do because a lot of people use their life savings to put up restaurants all over town and if you put up 10 and you lose two you just lost four or five years worth of work maybe more yeah because you can't come back it's hard to come back the banks won't talk to you your if you had investors they won't give you any more money because you know it's there's no telling but then when we when this hit mike and i decided that this year is wiped clean we are going to take a break reevaluate everything okay, held on to most of my senior staff and the people that have been with us for a really long time we held on to them um, unfortunately i had to personally call a lot of people and tell them that they're on furlough or uh, they don't have a job that was the single most difficult thing I had to do other than, you know, hearing the news that, you know, my father passed away, right? So it was tough. For a good three weeks, I was in zombie land. I was like, what happened? Yeah. But then, like everything else, this shall pass. So I'm a firm believer of when life gives you lemon, you make lemonade out of it. Not only lemonade out of it, you put up a few stands in each corner and you figure it out, you sell it, you come back out of it, right? So no business owner would ever want to shut down their restaurant and do remodels or do anything. We are doing just that right now. We are remodeling most of our older spaces. We are fine-tuning the way we operate it. We are looking under the hood everywhere from accounting to marketing to anything that you can think of. We are streamlining so that we can come back better than we were. We were just chasing. Everybody was chasing. You know, everybody, if you think of you know, saying the average worker, they would basically, okay, I'm just gonna have a six pack or go to a bar or whatever. 
and I'm not going to save. I'm going to rack up, you know, live my life on a credit card, whatever, right? You know, all that stuff. It's like 2008, 2009. We didn't learn anything. And we were on that verge. And then as soon as the music stopped, all of a sudden you're left without a chair. And what do you do? Most of the businesses were like that too. We were growing, 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 growing. And we thought the music is going to continue to play. But it, it stopped. It stopped hard. We opened a brand new restaurant. We were flying high, you know, in Fort Worth. Our restaurant that we opened in December of 2019 was killing it. In three months, that restaurant came to a screeching halt. Right? So it was, it was a beating to take, but then we figured that we need to learn from our mistakes or what we have done. And then hopefully when we come back this time, we, we will still make a lot of other mistakes, but the ones that we have made and cost us money or time or energy or effort or hair, we should avoid doing or making those mistakes. So that's what I've been kind of doing is and plus spending a lot of time with family with my son you know my wife you know it's you know so doing connecting with some friends where i can i think that's what we've been we've been doing and we'll we're retooling we're actually talking to a lot of people about fresh deals new deals new looking looking at new locations so we're loading up for the next 10 years of of growth Wow. That's incredible. And, you know, before we started recording on the show, we were talking a little bit about just challenges and opportunities. And I love that mindset of really searching to find the silver lining in sometimes even the most difficult situations. And, you know, I can't imagine what you had to go through in terms of what you shared about having to call people and, and share the news that, hey, we've got to make some, some tough decisions that's going to affect your life. Right. And, and just how difficult that is. But at the same time, understanding that there's opportunities for you to continue to say, how can we get better? How can we learn from this? How can we grow to provide for people down the road and really make sure that we continue the growth? Um, it's inspiring and it's, it's really interesting to hear. I think in this world that we're living in in 2020, I don't know that there's an industry that's been affected more difficultly than, than the restaurant industry. And, and it's and like you mentioned, it's, it's a very, very hard and challenging thing. And so to hear your story of what you're doing and how you're reacting to this is, is like I said, it's inspiring. Right. We, we, we shut everything down, but we kept one restaurant open, which is our Chop House Burger in downtown Dallas. And what we, the people that we kept, they needed something to do. Yes, we can mail them a check. Yes, we can all get a paycheck. That's, that's fine. But what do you do? Most of the people are, you know, working from Zoom, you know, working from home. Our industry, we're not cut out for that. We can't, we can't you know, have a Zoom meeting and, and serve you, you know, tacos or burgers or whatever have you, you know. So we, we can't necessarily do that. Our industry is not cut out for that. So... It was a difficult time the first couple of weeks. Then what do we do with our time? So then, you know, I turned Chop House Burger into a community, community kitchen. And I started delivering meals just from us to the hospitals who were doing, you know, COVID, who were taking in a lot of COVID patients and to the nurses and doctors and whatnot. So that gave us a sense of purpose that, hey, this is something we're waking up, putting up our, you know, our, putting our clothes on, putting our mask on, coming out, cooking, having fun and packaging. And then we're going out like Uber delivery guys, delivering that on that. And then next thing you know, um, Jose Andres' team saw that and call us up, say, hey, we are expanding into Dallas. We need a kitchen uh, to provide meals. Uh, while you do that, we'll also pay you, you know, you know, let's do a joint venture with you for two months and then do meals uh, to, um, to various um, uh, hospitals in, in Dallas. So we became a part of the World Central Kitchen. 
uh, of Jose Andres and then did that. So that took me, otherwise we would, I, I don't think since it shut down, there's not one day that I didn't come to downtown. One day I didn't come to the office or our restaurants here or our restaurant here to, to, to work. We didn't stop coming because we wanted to do something. Otherwise it was driving us insane, right? Because we're, we're in the hospitality industry. We're, we're glad handing people. We're, we're shaking hands. We're, you know, raising, raising a glass. That's what we do. We take care of people, right? And all of a sudden you're not taking care of anything. So to keep the morale up for the people that were with us, that we held on, we started running that kitchen and that got us through the most difficult, the first few months, three, four months that we, we have something to do. Otherwise everything was shut down. So then we started while doing that, we started formulating a plan of comeback. So I call it DRG 2.0. So uh, right now I'm working on DRG 2.0. I love it. Well, I have to say, Nafis, uh, during that time, I actually saw you on TV yeah. um, being interviewed for the work you're doing. And I have to say, man, I was very proud to see that. And yeah. uh, it was it was really cool. And I think you inspired a lot of people with the work you did. And obviously, I know you helped a lot of people um, with that. So major props, major, major kudos for what you're doing with that. It was very, very, very cool. As much as I helped them, it helped us. It helped right. us to uh, stay sane and do the work that we do. You talked about the purpose there, you know, like the, the purpose behind what you're doing. And it's more than just the job. You know, right. you're, you found your calling, you know, right. you, you yourself have had this journey that led you to a calling. And now I think you're able to help those other people that are surrounded by you that stuck with you to really have, again, that sense of purpose right. in serving others. You said it right there and I'll recap this later too, but like tell like that's what you do. You take care of people, right. you know? And, and I think that's a great lesson for everyone is putting those people first, putting other people first and using what you know and how you can help other people. I think it's pretty impactful and it, it gives you more than just a job and a career. It gives you a sense of purpose. Right. You, you, you essentially cannot take care of everybody in the world, even though most people are well-intentioned and they would like to do that. So I, you know, I, I follow this principle. Um, in, in our company, in my life, that, you know, in, 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 in the company that we have, I take care of five to 10 people. They, they are me, like I an extension of me. And I need to make sure that I am there for them, regardless of how it happened. And each of those 10 people has 10 other people or five other people that they are taking care of. And then each of those 10 people are taking care of some other people. So at the end of the day, hopefully everybody's taken care of, mm -hmm. right? You can't technically take care of, have a blanket policy or not policy is the wrong, is a wrong choice of word, but you can't have blankly take care of everybody equally. But then if you have a few people that, you know, these are my go-to guys, and I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna do everything I can so that they are loved and taken care of. I do just that. And if they follow the same principle and they do it, they will take care of their 10 people. And those 10 people are gonna take care of their 10 people. So all of a sudden you have a tree that is taking care of a lot of people. Where do you think that came from? Where did that philosophy come from for you? I don't know. I've, I've seen, you watch movies, you read a book, you know, you, you, you see other people, you know, are close with, 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 with other people. And they, they, like you have friends, but then you have 300 people, uh, friends on your Facebook, but they're not really are all your close friends. You're close to, three or four or five people, I want to make sure that those five people that I'm close with, it's like this. And I am there, thick or thin, whatever, no matter what happens. I'm just not going to be just a pigeon. I'm just going to be, I'm going to be there for them, thick or thin, right? And I follow that same principle for the way that we also run our company. And I think for me, it works out. There, there are drawbacks to it, 
where other people may feel left out or say, hey, this person only cares about these people and not these people, right? So there's always that. There's a balancing act, right? But then if I'm taking care of them and somebody else is taking care of me, right? Eventually, everybody should get taken care of if we're all doing the right thing. Now, somewhere along the line, if one or two people breaks the chain, that's when the system collapses, our system breaks down. So that's something that we have to take care of. Ish, you, you talk the talk and you walk the walk. Yeah. And I love your approach to leadership. And I think what most people maybe don't realize that we're all leaders in different aspects of our lives. And I hope the conversation we've had tonight has given them some different things to think about, has given them some aspirations, some diff just different ways of approaching the challenges and opportunities in their lives. And as we're kind of drawing to the close of our time tonight, um, Sammy and I have three questions that we'd like to ask you. Yeah, and then we'd like to share some of our takeaways from our conversation with you tonight. So Sammy, if you want to start with uh, the first question to Nafis as we start to wrap up our time together. Gotcha. So during your life, what has been one of your favorite actions, methods, or lessons you've learned in terms of your self-development and growth? Okay. Um, I, I believe in learning from others, having sounding board, advisors, mentor, whatever you call it, right? I have, I try and find those people all around me. I, in the last 10, 15 odd years, I've found five or six of those people that I value dearly and I bounce off my ideas or problems or, you know, opportunities by them, get their feedback and then try and make an informed decision. I don't have them make my decisions, but then that helps me through the process of whatever I'm gonna do. If I'm gonna buy a house, buy a car, buy, a, you know, do a new restaurant, do a, a, another business plan, whatever. Um, I kind of share with them, discuss it, hash it out, and then make my decision. It really helps me go through the process and, and make a better decision not that they are right decisions but then given the information at hand they helps me make better decisions that's wonderful it's great advice the feast think about bumper stickers yeah can you share a short piece of advice that you've either read heard been told seen in a movie that has just really stuck with you and resonates with you you reap what you sow I don't know if you can see this, but this is my daily planner. Yeah. And I write that at the top of my weekly planner every single day. Yeah. You reap what you sow. Yeah. Both good or bad. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and the last one I know because we've got we've got to get you out of here. Um, I guess there's two there's two part question. First part is. We have to say that we will do this again when we yeah. can extend our time later. Cause I know we're, we're just scratching the surface of who you are. So we hope that you have enjoyed your time with us um, today. And, and I know I've just, I can hear your stories and, and learn from you all day long. So thank you very much. Um, so what advice would you give to your future self 10 years from now? So 10 years into the future, you run into Nafis. What would you tell him? Um, worry, I wish I worried a little less about stuff, right? You know, you, you worry about different things at different levels and some of those worries never even pan out, but you were worried before that happened, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, I wish I worried a little less on a lot of the problems that we all go through. 
and focus more on the problem and how to resolve it rather than worrying about it, right? Um, and the other thing would be, you know, if I were to go back to college all over again, um, rather than chasing the book or the grade, I wish I had 10 times more uh, friendships that I've built along the way. You know, books are books. There's no way around it. You have to go through it. You have to do it. But then a lot of us get focused on honed in on, on, on a result or an end result rather than enjoying the ride. I think I have to learn or I'm learning how to enjoy this ride because it's, it's, it's a beautiful ride. And you may try and figure out that, hey, it's imperfect or it's somebody else has it better, whatever. You actually have it. If you woke up this morning, you actually have it better. And I think we, I'm saying this to, to you guys, but then I need to figure out a way to practice this even more, right? So 10 years from now, I was like, hey man, it was, it was better than the last 10 year block, if I make it. Well, I think from your, from your background, your resiliency, your uh, understanding and, and just your attitude on life and, and in general, and from the friendships and mentors and people that know you, I'm sure that these next 10 years are going to be a pretty amazing, impactful time, not only for you, but for your family, for your friends and those connections and your businesses as well. Um, because I know that you definitely pour in a lot of time and energy and effort into each one of those. And again, I'm proud to call you a friend of mine and, a, and someone that I could send an email to and, and we connect on this. So it's a, Again, you've got, you've got anything you need from us to for sure. And we're proud to be able to share your message with other people too. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's, a, it's been a pleasure, you know, to have known both of you guys, you know, uh, it's, it, Dallas is a great place and it's great because of people like you guys, man. You guys are always, you know, hustling, the good hustle in Dallas, man. You guys are everywhere. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, Nafis. Um, as we wrap things up, Shami and I like to share three things that we took away from our conversation. And, and I'll jump in and go first because I want to I want to I want to say some things before Sammy steals them from me. <laughs> but uh, Nafis, I love the fact that you said kind of kind of a saying that we've always heard: when life gives you lemon, you make lemonade. But right. I love what you added to that. Right. And then I want to go on and put a lemonade stand in every corner. Right. Uh, what a great takeaway. And then of course, just the, 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 the point that you talked about in terms of really taking care of your people and serving others, I think was powerful. And it kind of leads into the third thing. I, I really love what you talked about. And I almost imagined like a pyramid model in my mind of, of taking care of five people right. and then really coaching them up to take care of five people right. and having those people coach. And that's what leadership really is. Leadership is developing other leaders. That's one of the true marks of what a true leader is. Can you develop other leaders? And really, what's more fundamental in leadership than taking care of people? And that really resonated with me. And I appreciate you sharing those, um, those stories and those examples. And quite honestly, I loved everything about our conversation tonight. And I specifically want to have you come back on soon to talk nothing but traveling. Yes. <laughs> because that's one thing that we weren't able to get into tonight. Yeah, that, yeah. And I cricket. can't wait to do, because you and I have had some conversations in the past about traveling. And you've changed my mindset on the importance and the commitment and the priority of doing that in your life. But that's for another conversation at another time. So Sammy, what are your three takeaways? So my three takeaways are number one, you mentioned this at the very beginning is like, we're all the same. You know, we're not, we're not that different. Um, which is, which is a key factor, especially in some trying times that we're in now, yeah. you know, uh, number two is I like the, my dad was, is, is and, and was a mechanic. So growing up, I was always into the garage, just messing with things, but learn the switches, you know, like a car, like understand what your, what your vehicle does, understand how you operate something to then get a bigger picture of, of how it all works overall. And then again, the last thing that I mentioned was, uh, that's what we do. We, we take care of people. And I just think that's just a mantra that can be used in so many, so many different aspects of life is take care of other people. Uh, be it the five, the 10, whatever you have. And, but if you put that for, you know, 
foremost in your mind, I think it's going to be a pretty impactful life that you're going to live. It ends up working out, man. You know, we worry about, you know, I'm going to do something for some people. What if that person doesn't, you know, do it back to you? It doesn't matter. Somebody else, somebody, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. You know, you just help out and help out when you can and wherever you can. And it comes back to you. Great. If it doesn't, great. You just move on. Yeah. I think uh, life, actually, we're, we're, we're fairly fortunate, man. We're, we're, we are fortunate, fortunate beyond, you know, measure. Um, and I think we need to look into and, and see how fortunate we are. You know, we cry about things, we uh, gripe, moan, you know, but we are fairly fortunate, man. Absolutely. Well, the feast, we've talked a lot about your restaurants tonight. Where can people go? to find out where they can uh, see and learn a little bit more about your restaurants and uh, learn a little bit more about you. DRGconcepts.com. Perfect. Yeah. So go check it out. Um, and then obviously for our audience, if you have not picked up a copy of Sammy and I's book, The Pursuit of Growth, you can find that at www.libtpg.com. And uh, on our website, you can also follow us on all the social media channels. So. And Nafis, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for carving some time out tonight. Enjoy this conversation and cannot wait to have you back on again. Yeah, that was a quick one hour, man. Yeah, time flew. I didn't feel like it were, we're, we're anywhere other than a bar having a conversation, right? Well, if we cross our fingers, maybe the next time we do this, it'll be in person and it'll yeah. be over some drinks. How about that? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Love it. Yeah, That's very great. good, man. For having me. You know, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You know, uh, Nadia says hi. Uh, she knows I'm, I'm doing this tonight. And, you know, um, she would love to be on your on your deal at some, some point. Absolutely. So, I've, we've got to tell her that she's booked. We would uh, love to have her. <laughs> yeah. Right, good seeing you guys. Thank you well, so much. Very good, man. I, I, I look, I look, see everybody later. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah. Bye. Go get some waffles, man. Okay. <laughs>